Tonight we're going to we're in for a really good session, um, film festival secrets and strategies. Uh, I'm Pat Fisk, who's Julia Overton, and we'll be moderating. Um, Julia has been to lots of markets and lots of festivals, so, and I've been to a few, so we'll be able to add bits and pieces too. And we're lucky to have Jenny Neighbor from the Sydney F um, Film Festival, David Roca from Antenna Documentary Festival, Matt Revier from Possible Worlds, the US and Canadian Film Festival, and Dale Fairbairn from Screen Australia. First up, I'm, I'm going to run through how the Sydney Film Festival com program comes together and then provide what I hope are a few handy festival submission tips. Um, our 61st festival only finished a month ago, but we've already started shaping our budgets and deadlines for the 2015 festival. And we're beginning to think about retrospectives. I'll take hints, if you like. Um, when I say we, I'm talking about our progr my programming colleague, Festival Director Nishen Moodley. Um, Nishen focuses on features, and I look after documentaries and short films. And we work together on the rest of the lineup. We also have a film advisory panel. It's made up of about 25 local filmmakers and academics and cinema enthusiasts. And the panel members specialise in features or documentaries or shorts, and they focus on various regions or genres. Um, and we aim for each film submitted to the festival uh, to be viewed by two panellists at least, and their recommendations are then viewed by Nishen or me. And we also have specialists for various sections of the festival. For example, our Freak Me Out strand is curated by Richard Kuypers, a film critic. Uh, and the Dendy Awards for Australian short films are shortlisted by a panel of six. We appoint those each year. And it's usually a mixture of filmmakers and academics and critics and distributors. So that's our kind of programming team, if you like. Um, we also have the odd uh, retrospective curator as well. What are we looking for when we're talking about our program? Um, it's a curly question, but we aim to create um, a program of quality and balance across a range of genres and topics and genders and styles and cultural backgrounds, um, both locally and internationally. We look for new and established talents we look for passion, integrity, originality, and we also take into account potential audience, marketing, and media profile. So it seems like a very long list, but we really do juggle all those to shape um, a good program. There isn't a standard. Um, a film needs to achieve what it sets out to do on its own terms. That's kind of how we look at it. How do we find the films for the program? So the festival call for submissions goes public in October each year and closes around the end of February. Uh, in 2014, we used the online festival submission service, Film Festival Life. And on this site, filmmakers can read our regulations, complete the form online, pay a submission fee, upload their film and their press kit. And we can control access and can tag specific films for the panel members to view where they can provide comments and rate them and recommend a second or third viewing. We don't actually heavily promote our call for entries internationally. We do so locally, but not internationally, simply because we don't have the resources to process and view thousands of entries like the bigger festivals overseas. And we like to think we're about quality, not quantity. But in 2014, we received just over 800 submissions via Film Festival Life. And we see films at festivals overseas. So Nishen will be heading to the Venice Film Festival at the end of August, uh, followed by Toronto in September, Busan in October, Dubai in December, and then Sundance, Rotterdam and Berlin in the new year. And my first trip will be to CPH Docs in Copenhagen and the International Documentary Film Festival in Amsterdam in November, and then Gothenburg and Berlin in the new year. Before I head off, I'll do my research, more about that later. And once the film festival program is online, I'll study the films and the session times and work out the best viewing schedule, locking in key titles, things of particular interest. And at Berlin, this is a particularly time-consuming and challenging task because there's about 800 sessions to consider and juggle. But last year, I viewed around 250 titles at festivals overseas, about six films a day, uh, give or take, um, depends on the length, um, but that's pretty much what I aim for. 
So how do we hear about them? Well, soon I'll start researching what films are rumoured to be on the festival circuit for the coming year. I'll look at industry media online as well as newsletters and websites and also check out what the key sales agents and production companies have on their cards um, for the coming year. And having worked at the festival for a long time and have met many filmmakers, I try and keep in touch with what they're doing, uh, making sure they know our deadlines. And this is particularly key with local filmmakers, and, but it applies internationally too. And last but not least, we work with local distributors viewing films that might be available for the film festival um, and local producers as well, seeing what films they have. So all up, how many films do we consider? Well, it varies each year, but it's somewhere between 1,600 and 1,800. Um, and this year we screened 188 films. Uh, so if you take out retrospective titles, that's roughly 9% of the films we saw we selected. Um, and it's generally accepted that international festivals select between 2 and 10% of the titles submitted. And I know Dale has some more accurate figures on that, but that seems to be the industry gossip is round about there. So and now a few tips about how to bring your film to a festival programmer's attention. Uh, first up, know your film. Know its footprint, by which I mean its subject, its publicity angles, its audience potential, and its appeal and its topicality. And don't forget to think about your profile too. And then choose the right festival for your film. Uh, don't just look at the biggest or the highest profile, look for the best fit. Uh, that can be in terms of the program, the style and their approach. And, and do your research, look at past programs online, um, look at kind of uh, what uh, people have said, like IndieWire have said about those festivals. And scale, have a look at the scale of a festival. Will your film get lost in a program? Um, would a specialised or smaller film festival be a better bet? And timing. Don't rush to make a decision. Don't leave it too long. But don't rush to submit. Make sure you finish your film in the time frame it needs. And only enter if you think it's the right festival if you've done your research. Read the entry guidelines and regulations. Um, <laughs> numerous times I get kind of phone calls and emails, people asking questions, and it's all there in the, on, the, on the website and it's all in the regulations. You just have to read them and make sure your film fits the bill. And then fill out the form and don't forget your contact details, which strangely enough get forgotten. Um, and meet the deadlines. Uh, film festivals can be lenient sometimes but deadlines are often there so that they have time to do what they need to do to shape the program and publicize it and usually there are print deadlines involved and finally provide what the festivals ask for um, a press kit it doesn't have to be glossy it just has to be accurate and images are really important, but more so with um, online now. A memorable image um, we find in the film festival all the time. If you've got a good image, it gets used everywhere for all sorts of reasons. Um, and provide the film in the right format for previewing. And really important, check if you send a link or a DVD, check that it works all the way to the end. Um, I can't tell you how many we get a year uh, uh, that don't. They just don't quite finish where they should. Um, and a trailer or a clip, increasingly useful again. And a biography and filmography. Um, make them concise and accurate. They don't have to be fun, but they don't have to be lame either. Uh, why didn't your film get selected? It was ineligible, clearly just didn't meet the criteria or the deadlines. It didn't fit the festival's approach or balance. Uh, perhaps it wasn't culturally relevant to that specific film festival. The competition is intense. There are only a handful of slots available. And remember that only 2 to 10% get selected. So don't feel totally defeated. It really is a fierce world out there. And lastly, simply, some films just aren't good enough. But Can I just interrupt you one minute yeah. here? Because very often you've made you, people have made their film ineligible by mistake. Like they've had one screening at a small festival. For instance, I know this happens with you a lot. Could you just, I think that's important. Yes, I mean, part of the eligibility rules are usually the premiere status. And most film festivals um, kind of stake their territory. They'll say it has to be a Sydney premiere or New South Wales or 
a world premiere or European premiere, and you have to look at those details in the regulations carefully to make sure that you adhere to them. Because sometimes if you've shown in a small festival or even a large festival in Australia, that will have mean that you're no longer eligible to enter another festival overseas, and you have to know those before you start making your choices. If you get accepted, you need to deliver your DCP or your video on time and check it yourself. Um, the festival checks them, but you need to make sure that the sound of vision are how you mean it to be as well. And check it all the way through. That's before you send it to the festival. You also need to work with the festival's marketing and publicity teams. Make sure you, they have what they need to promote your film. Make sure you turn up for interviews and that you know who you're talking to and that you're briefed. And also ask the festival what they've planned to do to promote your film. How are they going to sell it to the world? Also use your own contacts from social media to friends and family funding bodies. Make sure they promote your screenings, whether it's at home in, or in Australia or abroad. Make sure everyone knows that your film's in that festival and that there's going to be a screening and it's going to get some profile. And finally, make the most of it. Attend the festival if you can. Go to the parties, do the intros, meet other filmmakers and really enjoy the audience. Hopefully their applause, but also their response. Here's, not, here's what you shouldn't do. Don't submit before you're ready. Don't just submit to every festival. Do your research. Don't ignore regulations. Read them. Don't ignore deadlines. Don't accept offers or hold screenings, and that includes premieres, before you work out your festival or your release plan. And don't sit back and leave your festival screening to itself. And that's about it. Uh, what are we looking for? Uh, we're looking for creative, cinematic uh, documentaries that give some kind of new perspective on the subject matter. In other words, we are looking for good films. Um, we have three competitions. We have the international, the Australian, and the, the short competitions, all with cash prices. The, the way the selection works is we, we're a little bit re restructured this year. So we, we formed two committees. Uh, we have the pre-selection committee that um, that's going through all the submissions. And um, the same as Jenny mentioned, I think that uh, at least two people watch every, every submissions. And in case one of them recommended us to program it, uh, it's moved to the next level, which is the the, pre the, the selection committee. Uh, the selection committee is five of us um, that are watching all consider all films in consideration, and we are meeting um, every now and then to uh, basically discuss them. So all films in consideration has been discussed. Well, it doesn't mean that uh, the decision has been made uh, democratically, but uh, it means that every film um, in consideration has the has the room to be discussed with other people, not only with myself. Um, the submission usually open in mid-February um, and and, um, and close by the end of May, which is around four months, which is a long time, but uh, I wanted to recommend not to leave it to the last moment, and I think it's relevant to all festivals. Um, the way programming works is that it's like kind of, um, it's like building a puzzle, um, and every when you don't know what will be there, the the the, the full picture uh, when you start programming, and every submissions the, the the pictures is filling in, but then it means that you know it's it, it means that other submission cannot be accepted. For example, um, we are not likely to select two films on the same subject matter unless they are very much uh, extremely different in their approach. Um, also, bear in mind that we are, for example, uh, we finish to program, we finish our festival in October. By November, we are starting to watch film for the following year, which means by the end of May, we are likely to be secured around 70% of our program, which means there is less, you are competing on less slot. Um, in terms of um, the international landscape, um, so when you're trying to develop your, your strategy for, to find your right festivals, I think that, uh, that of course that it's first and foremost depends on the film, but, um, and your goals, and I think that Matt will be speaking about it. 
festivals, even those festivals in your A-list uh, festivals are very, very much different mm -hmm. from each other. Um, in terms of what they're looking for, how, as Jenny said, how is their structure, how many documentaries they select, mm -hmm. and, um, and what each, each of them offer film, uh, filmmakers in case of selection. So, as Jenny suggested, just get to know them better um, in many ways, but I think that the best way, again, is to read what they're looking for. But as you know, we are always getting this um, vague and very wide description of what festival are looking for. I think that the best way is actually to, to look what there has been selected, have been selected in their festivals in the last few years. Um, I'll give just a few uh, examples of things that we can learn from, from those festivals. Um, and everything is basically published online, of course. Um, festivals like Cannes, for example, again, every, you can, every documentary is eligible to submit. But when we look at their program uh, for this year, for example, we can see that only six documentaries has been selected for Cannes. Uh, and all by very, very uh, high-profile filmmakers, like uh, Friedrich Weizmann or Wim Wenders or Steve James. It doesn't mean that you should not apply or you should not submit to Cannes, but, um, but just I think it gives some kind of perspective of, of what to expect. Um, another example is the, the Berlinale, that have um, the Berlin Film Festival, which has two sections. Um, Mainly, mainly two sections that accept uh, documentaries. One is the forum that accept more uh, experimental work. Um, how do they say that? Uh, the cross between art and cinema or art, something like that. And, um, and the main section that accept uh, international documentaries is the, um, the panorama section. The panorama section, uh, again, the, the description is very wide, but when you look at the program, you can see, again, there's lots of different documentaries, but since they have the, what they call the, um, sorry, the Teddy Award, yes. yes. And the Teddy Award, they likely to select, the Teddy Award is a special um, award for um, LGBT films which means that there, there is more room for LGBT films at the Panorama, uh, or at the Berlinale in general. Um, they also have those sidebars like culinary. Yes, so there's a, a different sections mm -hmm. that you have. Yeah, that's true. Um, the South by Southwest, again, is because it's a, it's, a, it's a music festival as well as interactive conference. They have more, um, they like, again, they're open for any kind of films, but when you look at the program, they're likely to select more uh, independent music documentaries or some kind of documentaries with uh, popular appeal. So, um, so while you're doing your research about the international uh, landscape, I think it's important also to, uh, to not dismiss the specialized, maybe less uh, glamorous, but excellent documentary film festivals. Uh, those festivals can sometimes uh, serve your film better and um, yeah, and you have you have much more of a chance to get in uh, to be selected. Uh, there are at least twenty documentary festivals that you should pay attention to. Um, I wanted to mention only five today. Um, um, I'm, I assume that you're already familiar with the big ones, as like Idfa, Hot Dogs, and Sheffield. So I thought to skip them. Uh, I've met recently um, directors of five festivals that specifically mentioned that uh, Australian filmmakers are not sending them films, so I thought it's a good opportunity to let them know about. Um, I'll try to do it quickly, sorry. Um, Doc Leipzig in Germany is a great festival. Um, it's the oldest festival in the world. For documentaries. It's, uh, it was formed in 55. They have very high quality program and uh, since 2004 a growing and important uh, marketplace for documentaries. Last year they selected around 300, um, 300 films from around the world and 1,700 professionals and buyers attended the festival. They have uh, competitions with uh, generous cash prices, they have the co-production meeting, they have a plat uh, which is a platform for, to find uh, fine 
co-production uh, partners. They have pitching sessions. They have, since last year, they have also the Doc Leipzig Net Lab, which is a two days of interactive um, conference. Uh, because it's in October, uh, this is a big issue, uh, but, but because it's in October, it's a direct competitor for IDFA and the Berlinale. It, their market is much smaller than those two festivals, but uh, the festival is very inclusive and uh, provides great opportunities for filmmakers. Another great festival in Europe is Vision de Rel, um, which is in Switzerland. It's, again, it's an old festival. It established in 1969 and very quickly made a name for itself as one of the most important uh, events for documentaries. Looking at the program, they're likely to select films uh, that are more artistic, creative and experimental uh, documentaries. Um, they, they seem like very proud of promoting uh, non-commercial and, and air films, not commercial and not uh, mainstream films. As part of the program, they also have a marketplace called Doc Outlook, um, where 1,400 professionals attended this year. They have uh, pitching sessions, roundtables, one-on-one -on -one meetings, rough cut labs for young filmmakers, etc. Again, it's very, uh, it's much smaller than than the big ones like Eid Farm, um, but the it's, it's a, it's, it makes it easier to connect with people. The smaller environment, it's intimate, very easy to talk to people, and it seems like they emphasize the creativity, the art of documentary, and the persona. Interesting festival is True False Film Festival in, in, uh, in Missouri, in, in America, which is a small, young, non-competitive, in a small town in the middle of nowhere in America, <laughs> with no marketplace, but interestingly, becoming one of the most influential documentary festivals on the circuit. And some of the people, some of the people who select for True False are also spotters for Sundance. That's the bigger true. Festivals. They select only 40 films a year, um, 40 films a year, and but they invite all the filmmakers to attend the festival. They have a kind of a policy that. Uh, that they only select films that the, the, the directors uh, confirm their attendance. And that it makes it a kind of a big celebration for filmmakers. Um, the fact that it's only 40, again, they can give lots of attention for each film. Although they're gradually securing very big films uh, to premiere as a world premiere or, or American premiere or some kind of premiere, they, they resist the premiere pol policy by by not promoting the screening as premieres whatsoever. They claim that the system of premieres, and this is a different discussion, I believe, is not serving filmmakers. They started in 2004 with 4,000 people. Last year, uh, they, or this year, they got 45,000 people attending the festival. Again, it's not a marketplace, but the place where filmmakers, the programmers, and industry coming to basically celebrate documentary filmmaking. No. Uh, we invite, but they we had them here. They, they came here, didn't yeah. they, for David's festival. Two festivals outside of Europe and America, quickly. Um, there is the Yamagata Film Festival, at one of the most respectful and important festivals in Asia. Uh, they're also looking for creative documentaries. They call it the radical works from around the world that focusing on documentaries and art. Um, they program around 15 international films and competitions. They have competition for Asian films. Um, it's not a marketplace, but again, it's a place that um, to, de to, to develop network uh, and develop collaboration with Asian, the, the Asian industry. And last one is a, a festival in Brazil called It's All True. Um, it's one of the, the leading documentary events in Latin America. Besides screening films, they, they mostly focus on the academic side of, of documentary filmmaking. It's not a marketplace, but, uh, but the festival and its director, Amir Labaki, are very uh, respected by the international industry. Amir is, um, I think he's on the IDFA yeah. board. Yeah. I met him recently, again, he complained that he's not getting submissions from Australia. Um, They have both competitive and non-competitive section for international productions. And uh, in terms of the industry, it's not attracting any international industry, but it's mostly the Latin America and the Brazilian industry uh, will be there. This is just a snapshot of the possibilities for documentary filmmaking. It's all true. 
is not getting submissions. Uh, yeah. Doc like Yamagata, I don't I think that Yamagata is getting, but people that told me uh, deliberatively was it all true in Brazil and Doc Leipzig in Germany. Oh. And I think that just to remember not to forget that there is other possibilities, but the, the A festivals, so there is, that festivals can serve your film. Um, all the, all the documentary industry, and it's a very small industry, knowing about those festivals and looking on those programs and your festival will be uh, will be treated well in those festivals and that's about it hi everyone i'm matt <coughs> matt ravier um i run a couple of small film festivals here in sydney um but i think i'm not going to talk really as a film festival programmer because i think jenny and David, have, have given you a lot of insights into what goes into programming a festival. Um, I'm more going to talk, I guess, about um, why you're entering festivals and what you're hoping to get out of it and what, therefore, should be um, your approach and your, and your thinking. And, and this isn't, I'm not talking as an expert at all. I'm talking as someone who's just spoken over a drink or two uh, with lots of filmmakers, lots of producers, uh, and lots of film festival programmers uh, at some of those big festivals that we've mentioned, uh, or at the Sydney Film Festival Hub, which I program for, for Sydney Film Festival, and where we get to, where I get to meet a lot of the filmmakers who, um, who drop by during the festival. And I like to quiz them about why they're here, what they're hoping to get out of the Sydney Film Festival, where they went before that, where they're going next, and why. Um, because I think you can, you can find out a lot from other people like you uh, who are going through that same process. So, I guess the real question as a filmmaker, as a producer, to ask yourself is why, what you're hoping to get out of those festivals. Um, a lot of the answers to that question are valid, um, but if you want everything, chances are you're not going to come away with a viable, interesting uh, festival strategy that works for you. Um, so you may have to choose. And so for example, is, it, is our festival, is the festival circuit your distribution for the film? Um, and if that's so, then you might want to uh, prioritize festivals that pay a screening fee or a cut of the box office. Um, are you hoping to, uh, um, you know, sell your film, find a distributor, a broadcaster, etc.? Then you would prioritize festivals, first of all, that cover travel, because you'll want to be there in person to do that. Um, festivals which are attended by the industry, uh, and uh, not every festival, as David just mentioned, have has a marketplace or has um, uh, the ability to get deals done. Um, is it about getting it seen by the most number of people? And that's a very valid uh, objective to have, and in which case you may look at the festivals that have the biggest and the highest attendance and have a, a very public-facing uh, uh, approach. Is it about changing the world? I know that quite a few filmmakers I've met are making films not for awards, not for even to express themselves creatively necessarily, but because they believe very strongly in an issue that they want to get out there. And some festivals are kinder to those films and are able to put you in touch with NGOs and um, people who can do something, take your film's message and, and actually leverage it into social change. Um, you know, those festivals may be more interesting to you. Um, is it about getting exposure, getting press, getting, getting prizes? Um, you know, those are perfectly valid reasons as well, but they will inform which festivals you enter. And I think if you enter yes to all of these, if you say yes to all of these um, questions, then you won't have an effective festival strategy because you're going to try to do everything um, instead of doing one or two things very well. Um, as, as Jenny said, every, every festival's got a different premiere requirement, so don't waste your world premiere uh, or, your, or your international premiere on a small festival. If you can, um, try to go for the big ones while being realistic, and I know that's really difficult to be realistic about your own film. I think every filmmaker, every producer is convinced they've made something quite extraordinary. Um, but even a small amount of realism in regards to, and I don't mean the worth of your film, but just it's, um, first of all, it's the size of its audience, uh, the originality of the work, um, how it'll stand out in a film festival submission pile, that kind of thing, it's really important. Um, 
Obviously, going for those big festivals can be interesting in that they attract invitations from other festivals, um, which also means you know what entry fees being waived. Uh, and and those of you who've done that festival circuit in the past in the past know that those can add up quite quickly. And often, when you've finished your film, you've kind of spent everything that you had uh, budget-wise, and you realize that actually the festival circuit is a very expensive uh, thing in itself. Um, so you know if you do. Uh, premiere at ITFA or at Sheffield or Hot Dogs, chances are you'll get invitations on the back of that. Um, I just had a drink with uh, Dave Rigos, who's sitting up there. Uh, Dave has a film in, in my next festival, the Possible Worlds Film Festival, um, and so we caught up for a drink, and I, want, I was curious to know where the film had gone and why, how he chose the festivals, and um, he very candidly you know, said, well, I, I tried Sundance and didn't get into that, and so that kind of informed where else I could go, uh, that and the timing of when my film was finished. And I think he had a very smart approach, which was to prioritize festivals that he knew he could get a lot of mileage for his film, uh, and it, you know, in order of importance and of, of priority based on the festival calendar. Um, he ended up doing his world premiere at Hot Docs, which I think was a you know a brilliant way to premiere the film, and as a result got invitations to you know quite a few festivals in the U.S. Um, uh, was part of the Best of Hot Docs program, which played in Vancouver as well. Um, so those ripple effects are really important, and that's they should inform where you where you have your premieres. Um, other festivals and other programmers offer various kinds of integrated distribution or exhibition opportunities which might be of interest to you. Um, Tom Powers, for example, who programs the docs at uh, Toronto, he also runs um, Stranger Than Fiction, uh, the documentary screening series out of the IFC Center in New York. Um, so and the absolutely. Um, Sean, who runs um, Hot Dogs, who programs the Hot Dogs, you know, founded Hot D Dog Soup as well, um, which uh, is a screening series that can attract up to a hundred, uh, up to a thousand people per screening, and and you know getting into hot dogs, getting uh, your film sh seen by those programmers can open those kinds of doors as well, uh, which are really really key. Uh, the San Francisco Film Society, which runs the San Francisco Film Festival, uh, partners with the Sundance Kabuki Theater, for example, to bring uh, week long engagements for festival favorites. So again, that's a festival that could open that door to um, uh, small but you know, not negligible uh, theatrical release uh, in San Francisco with the press that goes with it um, and, uh, and the revenue. So I think those are, should really inform your, your choices. Um, I would encourage you to budget, as I mentioned, for festival submissions and for festival attendance. Um, I've, I've talked to a lot of uh, film producers and looked at their budgets and notice that there was no line for that. <laughs> uh, and, and that's, I know it's difficult, but it is a big mistake because uh, you, if you run out of steam and you run out of money, uh, by the time your film is finished, you're going to miss out on quite a few big opportunities. Um, and it can, it can be quite expensive. Also give yourself time before your world premiere. Um, so many filmmakers are still completing their edits and their sound mixes, uh, you know, two weeks before the premiere. Uh, and that's such a shame because that's the time you should be spending on, first of all, doing your festival strategy, getting a team together to help you get the most out of those festivals, uh, getting the best assets and the best marketing materials you can. Um, so, actually, that's quite nice. Uh, <laughs> your, your film is only new for a certain amount of time. Once you've had your world premiere, the clock starts ticking on it, uh, and its newness it's newness, is uh, an asset. Uh, and so that, that gets spent quite quickly. So give yourself a head start. Uh, do all that work before your first world premiere so that you can hit the ground running and make the most of that time when your film is brand new and is a real hot commodity on the circuit. Um, again, a film that's playing at the Possible Worlds Film Festival, we're doing the world premiere of a documentary called Air Sex, the Movie. Uh, it's a documentary on the Air Sex World Championships. Um, you might not be familiar with Air Sex. I wasn't. But you all know Air Guitar. Um, so Air Sex is a little bit like Air Guitar, where you perform, you have sex with an imaginary partner on stage uh, for comedy. Uh, it's taken over the US comedy circuit by storm. It's a huge thing. It's hilarious. It's a lot of fun to watch. And they've made this really great documentary, which 
they want to have the world premiere at our festival, which I'm really excited about. Um, but they're still they're still working on it, you know. And it's such a shame because the fact that it's such an interesting subject that people are curious about, that's kind of funny um, and new to Australia, means that I've got journalists, you know, knocking on my door, going, "When can we see the film? We want to do an advance review. We want to do an interview, etc." Um, but they're frantically finishing the edit and they're frantically, you know, getting the materials together. They don't have stills, they don't have a trailer, um, they don't have a screener. And it's such a shame because they're wasting valuable uh, time. So uh, give yourself time before the world premiere. Um, benchmark as well. Uh, one idea that's come up quite often is to pick two or three documentaries that are similar to your own or you feel are similar to your own and don't hesitate to get opinions from neutral people who will be honest with you about whether that's the case. That's always very difficult, but it's so important to get some uh, a very kind of neutral opinion on your film. Uh, but try to find two or three documentaries that are on par with yours that have either a similar subject or a similar audience and look at where the, what festival circuit they had. Where did they have their world premiere? Where did they go to next? Uh, what worked, what didn't? And talk to the filmmakers. Um, it's surprising how, how isolated a lot of filmmakers are. And you should really go and seek out the filmmakers who've been through what you think you're about to go through with your film and learn from their mistakes. Um, people I find are incredibly generous with their experience. Um, so you know, don't, don't uh, neglect to do that. Um, do your homework. Uh, I mean, I think David's spoken quite well about that. Um, you know, what kind of festival is it? How many docs do they screen? Are you going to get lost because of the scale of it? Um, you know, we're talking with Dave about entering South by Southwest, for example. I've been there a couple of times, and I find that a lot of documentaries often don't get the attention they deserve. Uh, whereas in other smaller festivals, they might thrive, they might be taken extremely seriously, they might be given a lot of uh, a lot of attention, a lot of marketing, etc. So, uh, again, learning from filmmakers who've gone through that process is really useful. Um, meet with programmers uh, when you're doing your festival circuit. Obviously. Us programmers, we attend a lot of festivals, we hang out at the bar, go and talk to those programmers and find out who they are, what they're looking for, um, which festival they've been to, which ones they rate, um, what you can do to get the most out of the festival should you be selected uh, at their event, uh, who you should meet if you, if you go. Um, I think there are a wealth of, of knowledge and wisdom and advice and as long as you don't harass them in the two weeks leading up or the two months leading up to their festival, that's when they don't want to hear about you from you. Or I, I mean, I'm speaking for myself. Uh, they 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 want to hear very you know very uh, simple, precise questions that they'll be happy to answer. But they don't want to have a long conversation with you about what you should be doing with your film at that time. But when you meet with them at festivals, make the most of those meetings because I think um, I think there's lots of wisdom to be found there. If uh, you're going to, you're getting, you're lucky enough to have your world premiere at a very big festival, don't feel like you have to do it alone. Uh, it is worth hiring a consultant, or by then you may have a sales agent who can give you some advice. Um, make sure it's very clear who's going to be doing what on the ground, and then following from that, who's going to be responsible for deciding where the festival, wh which festivals the film goes to next. Um, I've 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 seen countless messes really messy situations where several people are entering festivals at the same time for the same film and then um, yeah it just doesn't doesn't work so make sure you know who's responsible for that and build a team of uh, ambassadors and helpers who can help you because you have to be everywhere at once and it's very difficult and time consuming also if you're a dedicated filmmaker with lots to say you may really want to be itching to do your next project and not want to spend too much time on that. So build a team early of people who can help uh, with that, uh, who can run your social media, who can secure media coverage, um, who can build a very uh, supportive, engaged community around your film. Um, you know, find a, an intern who can help you with the submission process, who can help you with uh, getting a database and a mailing list going, who can help you finding those contacts. Don't do everything yourself, but it's really helpful to have people who believe in your film and who will um, do that work with you. Um, the degree to which that team that you assemble is professionalized should be proportional to uh, the stature of your festival, the festivals that you're world premiering at. Um, 
you know, you won't go to Sundance without uh, probably a publicist, without a, a consultant, without a sales rep. Um, if you're going to a much smaller festival, you might just rely on friends and, and interns. Um, and remember that the festival circuit is the first part of your film's distribution sequence. Uh, a healthy and publicized film festival run will go a long way towards uh, boosting prospects for a more lucrative uh, VOD, iTunes, DVD distribution, um, as well as for the private screening circuit, like um, you know the universities and the museums. So uh, it's not just about your ego, and it's not just about the applause, it's also about building a very strong base for the rest of the distribution. Um, once you're in, all those plans and those goals, keep them written down because you'll be drinking a lot and you'll forget about what you wanted to do and what you wanted to get out of the festival. Refer to that. Uh, find support to get there uh, from Screen Australia or you know, if you wanted to do a crowdfunding campaign, maybe save it for that last bit uh, once your film is, is accepted into a big festival and you need that help that you maybe hadn't budgeted for to get there. Um, Speak to other filmmakers who've attended, get the most out of them and their experience. Also, see what the festival can do for you. Lots of festivals have very interesting quirks and interesting services. Um, if your festival is not in an English-speaking country, find out if they will subtitle the film for you. Um, and maybe waive your screening fees to make that happen, uh, because that's going to cost you a lot more if you have to do it yourself. Um, but if they do it and they give you the file and the time code, then you've got a subtitled film in German, in uh, Dutch, and that could be amazing to get um, a TV sale there or to get it seen there on, say, um, Netflix Netherlands. So uh, that's that can be really useful. Organize your meetings in advance as much as possible. Um, Promote your screening. Don't just rely on the festival. Uh, I've worked with some amazing filmmakers who've had films selected in our festival who um, promoted the screening before coming. Once they hit the ground, they, they did lots of um, uh, community building. Uh, they sought out their own press. Obviously, you want to work with the publicist of the festival, uh, but often they have you know, a hundred films to publicize, and if you want yours to stand out, make sure you make you put forward your best assets. You tell them that you're available for interviews. Uh, you provide them everything they need, and then you go and get leads yourself. No one knows the film better than you do. You know whether the interesting angles, whether the great stories behind it. So go and you know pitch to um, journalists, and then take that to the publicist. Um, I think that gets great, great results. Um, have a social media strategy, have a website. I mean, it sounds silly, but the number of filmmakers who come to festivals without any of those things and then wonder why they haven't been able to build a community to refer people to a place where they could get that information afterwards. Um, organize maybe drinks after your screening. That's how you build that community. Um, it's, it's not hard to do and it doesn't have to cost much, but I think it's really where you recruit those hardcore fans who will uh, be advocates for your film for months to come. Um, so organize drinks, but don't drink too much yourself. Um, I've, I've spent a couple of festivals uh, with filmmakers who were basically drunk from beginning to end. It's very easy to do because you're invited to so many parties, it's always open bar, there's lots of opportunities to, to do that, and then it's all a blur and you, the festival's over and there's a million things you wanted to do and you didn't. Um, so that's my very reasonable, boring advice. Uh, <laughs> try to have fun, but you know. Um, and use the screening uh, itself to understand your audience better. A lot of filmmakers or producers think they know who their audience for their film is until they have those first screenings at festivals. And then they realize that actually it's not necessarily who they thought. Or they've discovered a new niche audience they didn't know was there for their festival. I think that's extremely useful. Um, and if you can, start a mailing list. Um, I mean, I know filmmakers who use those screenings to death, and it can be a bit annoying as a festival organizer, but if you do want to sell DVDs at the back after the screening or collect uh, mailing, you know, email addresses, that's where you start building that community. Imagine if six months into your festival run, when you're starting distribution, etc., you have a list of, you know, 10,000 people who've seen your film and their emails. First of all, that's extremely useful to a distributor. Uh, but also, if you choose to retain the rights or some of the rights to your film and do it yourself, uh, sell DVDs from your website, etc., those are the people who are going to buy it uh, or buy it for their friends or recommend it. So, not taking that opportunity to create that mailing list for your film is is a real shame. Um, and uh, you know, I've I've seen filmmakers who do that. I've seen filmmakers who 
they go to a festival, they'll do their screening, they'll sell DVDs at the back, and then while they're in that town for that week, they'll contact every university, every college, every school, every museum, and they say, hi, I'm in town. You've probably heard that I'm premiering my film at the festival. I've also made these two other films. I'm available to do Q&As. I'm available to come talk to your students. I'm available to talk to your community group, etc., to present my film. Um, and they make the most of that visit that way. And I think that's really clever in terms of building a community, in terms of making a little bit of money as well to pay, to pay for your festival visit. Uh, and yeah, just making the most of that trip. Um, so yeah, those are just some of the tips that I've gleaned along the way. Uh, well, thank you. And uh, we've heard some very um, relevant tips tonight. And uh, so uh, we're gonna just sort of round that up now with um, some of the points I'll bring up. And I'm speaking today in my role at Screen Australia. One of them is I manage a thing called the Festival Visitors Program, where uh, Screen Australia invites out selectors from um, major international festivals to come here and look at uh, new Australian films for potential pre-selection at those festivals. Last week we had the selector from Busan. Uh, the month before was the selector from Venice. Uh, next week when I'm back at work I'll be uh, putting out an announcement that we've got uh, the gentleman from Khan Directors Fortnight coming in a month and I'll be preparing for the Berlin Selector in October and um, we've had the Toronto Selector here earlier this year and that selection process is underway right now. So um, as well I manage what was recently known as the Travel Grant Program at Screen Australia. It's now called the International Marketing Strategy Program, in case you're looking for it. Um, but it uh, brings together travel grants and some of the funding for things Matt's just mentioned, like um, publicists and um, promoting your film at festivals when they're selected. And I also um, man our stand at uh, Berlin Film Festival at the EFM. So, uh, as well as work with my other colleagues across a range of festivals um, where we have a presence, Cannes, Toronto, etc. So, and, uh, and it's never too early to start marketing your film. Um, it starts from the, from the beginning when, you, when you're first conceiving your project. So, why festivals matter? Well, um, Matt just told us of some very good reasons. In fact, all of our speakers have. But um, we've done some um, research on it and we can tell you that yes, they definitely will help you attract your audience. They're also gonna ha help you attract money. So you will definitely have an advantage sales-wise and financing um, future projects because of the credibility that you and your film will get from the right festival. So which festivals? Well, each of our speakers tonight has given you some really good things to think about and it depends on what your goals are for your film and what your goals are longer term for your filmmaking career. So it's the best one suited to your documentary. And it can be either international, uh, domestic or local. And keep in mind the ones that the industry attends are, are usually considered the big ones. This is some work that we did recently about the submissions that the major international festivals receive and then the slots available for Australian films. I think this is a pretty good indication of how competitive it is. And this might surprise some of you. If we were to go and do the statistics for the most recent festivals, it would probably look even more competitive. So, uh, I think that kind of tells the story. Everything you've heard tonight, um, there's something in it for you and it means about planning ahead. Look how many of the Australian films get into those festivals. Now we did have a bit of an anom anomaly in 2009 for Toronto Film Festival. They lost a program of Israeli films at the last moment. So Australian films uh, were invited to fill that space. So there's a few more there that year. But Australian films do perform very well internationally at these festivals and there's some good reasons why. Now you've just heard about um, world premieres etc. They want to be the first with the best films. They want, films have a shelf life, life just like vegetables and fruit 
at the greengrocers. So uh, after 12 months, your, your A-list festivals aren't interested anymore. So be aware when your film is new, you've got to plan accordingly and don't throw away what you've got. So the most important uh, one is your world premiere, then your international premiere, then your premieres at the various territories. So that's American, European, Asian, Australian. You have to think about all of those and, and plan it in, in advance. Personal connections. Now I get asked about this a lot and um, some filmmakers get very worried because they've heard that the only way to get their film into a festival is if they know the selector personally. Personal connections are very important. It's all about people. But have a think about it. It's not possible to know all the selectors personally. People move on to different jobs. They change. Even um, the Venice selector was here last month and he got to meet a lot of um, Australian filmmakers with new films. But then what he pre-selects goes through to a committee. So we don't know who's on the committee for all of those uh, films. So yes, you can establish personal connections, but don't be too worried if you miss out. Uh, it's just not possible to know everybody. At the end of the day, it's your film that will do the talking, number one, and number two is how it fits into their program, whether they've got something of a similar topic or, um, yeah, just to how it fits into the program. I think Jenny um, uh, pointed that out very well for you. So, but if you do get an opportunity to meet a selector, like Matt said, do take advantage of that opportunity and find out what it is they're looking for. And even if it doesn't help you this time around, um, what about your next film and your next film? So you'll build up those connections over time. Um, what is really important about personal connections is that you might have had a short film in that festival in previous years. Do let that festival know. They, uh, festivals usually love to support filmmakers uh, as they develop through their careers. So have a look at what, uh, what you're offering and what it is that you've got that they want. Uh, and those kinds of information, that kind of information is very important. I, I get all the submissions from all the filmmakers around Australia to show these international selectors and it's surprisingly how, surprising how often that sort of basic information is uh, left out. I go and research it and I'll go and find it and bring it to the attention of the festival selector. But um, I'm uh, suggesting that you keep that in mind too. Uh, it's always very important. Um, and did you know that these international festivals are tracking your films long before you finish them, long before you show them? Uh, we talk to those selectors uh, all the time about what's coming up, what they should look for, um, and they all want to be the first to see it and uh, time it for their festivals. So um, they probably already know about your film. Um, We've tried to make sure of that anyway, and we'll continue to do so. And perhaps you've already let them know from your previous connections or different times when you've met them, when they've been to Sydney or to um, another festival here. So um, keep, keep doing that. Now, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we've got on our website that's free, and I encourage you to have a look and to use uh, this as tools. Um, as you prepare your festival strategy. If you go onto the website and go to the marketing tab and you'll see um, a whole bunch of um, other sections there. So we've got the festival's profiles page. I update that myself. Uh, that's really handy when you're just planning out your annual uh, calendar of who, which festivals to submit to. If you need it in an Excel format, um, I can send it to you and it means you've got all the dates, the submission dates and the dates that the events take place. I've asked for several times for that to go up on our website but I've been told no but I'm happy to supply it to you. And it's just a really quick way for you to um, plan, plan your international festival strategy. We've got some marketing guides as well. So if we go to the next slide and uh, these are ones we've got particularly for documentaries all up there available for you to download. Thanks, Pat. 
And we've got publications such as our uh, annual documentary booklet. Now, this is available for you to, uh, if you've got uh, your projects in there, to download it and to provide it to people about your upcoming film. These are all films that are in production at the moment. Uh, we take it to the international markets and talk to the selectors about what's coming up. But so do uh, your sales agents or distributors will do the same. And for those of you who don't have um, sales representation yet, uh, it's a good way for you to um, present your project. Um, it was today I went to these publications and went back through three years' worth to um, draw out the photographs of films that have gone to um, festivals recently. Right, and another publication, Doing Business with Australia. So when you do um, attend the markets or festivals where there are international sales agents and distributors present or other filmmakers with whom you might want to collaborate, um, this publication is really good for them and it helps you be help to explain how they can work with you as an Australian project. So um, I don't know if some of you are heading off to MIFS soon, um, keep in mind there'll be people there who'll be looking to collaborate and these resources are there to, to assist you um, to, do, to talk to them. Now here's some things I thought I'd put in at the end because we asked some of the international uh, buyers what they want from producers and I thought you'd like to know what they told us confidentially. But this is, this is what they've asked for, so more marketplace knowledge. And that's stuff we've been talking about today and this stuff, that's some of that stuff's up on our website. Um, some of the reports from when people attend um, the uh, different festivals where they get travel grants, that stuff goes up on our website. So have a read of it and uh, if you don't know any of the filmmakers who attended those festivals directly, you can read their reports and tips up on the website. Um, understanding of deals, uh, realistic expectations, better key art, photography and publicity materials, I think that was Matt, and um, patience they've asked for. <laughs> I don't know about that. Okay, and this is what producers said they want from the sellers. So flexibility on deals, more resources, access to distributors, better communication and perseverance. I guess it comes back to that people thing. It is all about people in the end, isn't it? Anyway, um, some things to think about. Uh, thank you very much. If your, film, if your project isn't, hasn't got Screen Australia involvement, how does it get on your radar so you can tell selectors about it? Yeah, so we, uh, it doesn't have to have Screen Australia involvement to be uh, included in the uh, Festival Visitors Program. So we do a call out, so it usually goes out in our e-news and then it gets picked up by all of the uh, industry publications and um, they usually have then my name and phone number and email address and you just make contact and your project, as long as it's eligible by the festival's criteria, so it's not Screen Australia's criteria, it's the festival's criteria and as long as you meet that eligibility, it gets included in their program. Mm. Yeah, well, I would reiterate very strongly what they've all said, um, particularly Jenny, with the requirements for entry. Um, the number of times people have come to me and said, I want to enter my film into such and such a festival, and you look at the rules and you go, I'm sorry, it's not eligible for, it's too long, it's too short, or all sorts of reasons. Um, one of the things that no one's yet mentioned um, is Without a Box, which most of you, I'm sure, will know is a sort of fairly standard universal um, database for entering festivals. You register your film details and then you can match them up with the festival and enter. Um, I'd stress that you, you should pay a lot of attention to putting your details on there accurately and updating them. When you get a screening at a festival, you need to update that um, record for your film because that's what festival will see. And, and one little tip that I only came across fairly recently, um, on Without a Box, when you do the entry process, it usually comes to a box that says um, covering letter. You don't have to do one, but if you have one, put it here. Um, a lot of people, including me, for years thought, ah, oh, you know, they're not going to read a covering letter. Um, if there isn't much to say. So I've sort of ignored this. Apparently, 
when you get an entry through without a box, the first thing the festival sees is the covering letter, in which case you've wasted a huge opportunity. Um, and that's where you put something like, I think Dale was saying, you know, um, I've already screened at this festival two years ago, or my film is particularly relevant to your festival because of these reasons. Um, it's a personal story. And so, you know, anything that you think is going to get their attention, because that's your opportunity, so don't waste it. Um, the other two, there's all sorts of different festival entry, I don't know what you call them, database systems. Uh, Without a Box is the biggest by far. Um, there's two others that I wanted to mention for short film. Um, short Film Depot, which is... Um, the only way you can enter the Clermont Ferrand Short Film Festival, which if you've got a short film, you're probably going to want to enter. Um, so that has to go through Short Film Depot. And if you want to enter, um, I think it's Kurzfilm, um, Oberhausen, and definitely Encounters in Bristol, you need to go through Realport. All of these do exactly the same thing. You enter the same details in all of them. It gets really boring, but it's worth having your details up there. And as I say, it's worth updating. Well, you must update them every time you get a screening or something additional um, changes. So, um, oh, and, and the other thing I would stress yet again is photos. Um, the number of times people have no photos, they have terrible photos, or they aren't high enough resolution. Um, you need, when you're making your film, to get somebody with a decent camera to push themselves to the front and take photos. Otherwise, you've got nothing. No, not just somebody. Somebody, a good photographer. <laughs> yes, somebody who knows what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and bearing in mind that your photo will be used in anything from the size of a postage stamp to half a color, half a page, full color, glossy brochure. So it's got to be, what you take has got to work at those different sizes. So that's my <laughs> extra bit. <laughs> Uh, my name's Sonia Bible. I'm a filmmaker. Um, just about durations, um, you know, the broadcasters, they want 55 minutes. Um, you're making a film festival documentary. Is 55 minutes too short? Is it better for it to be 70, 80, 90, if, it, if it's right at that length? I was talking to a filmmaker about that and they said that it was extremely painful for them. They'd made a feature documentary. It was extremely painful for them to do so, but they cut a 55 minute. Um, they didn't master it or anything. They just put it to the side. But in every um, correspondence, etc., they said that both versions were available. And we're really happy they did that because down the line there was interest. And once there's an offer on the table that's more than the cost of mastering it, then it's worth doing. But at least you've done that. Um, so it could be that you know that that could be the way to go, um, but I know a lot of filmmakers who obviously have decided on the length it should take to tell the story and with very good reason. Um, so you may want to stick with that as well. But um, yeah, this okay, is an I option. Just, Sonia, I was just going to add too that very often when you get a sales agent, the sales agent will want two lengths because you'll get the longer version will be the the one that will go to the festivals and then mm. the broadcasters and you will make your money out of that for a short version. On the other hand, I'm just thinking, David, when we were at Hot Docs this year, uh, you saw a still from it, um, from the bottom of the lake, uh, which is a 55 minute film. And as it turned out, uh, it's about Jane Campion and the creative process. And it was timely because she was on the jury at Cannes this year, but also because they had a little, a film which actually showed it Sydney last year called The Pioneer, which was about the first woman director to work in Hollywood and France. And that was 17 minutes. So they worked as a perfect program and the programmer was really happy. So, you know, it's just, I guess, whichever is the right way. And ultimately, I think it is about what's right for that story. So, because um, I've seen many films that were a TV hour stretched to a feature length in inverted commas and they haven't always worked. So, the, you know, the international festival selectors, they want something that's truly a feature film. So it's going to depend on the particular story that you're telling and, and the style, etc. We try and show programs that are around about 90 minutes to two hours, but some 
much longer. Um, it's very difficult to program a 30 minute film. You've got to find something that it will partner with, that it will work well with. Um, particularly with short films, even 40, you know, 25 minute ones, 20 minute ones can be difficult if you're going to show it with a feature. It can make the session way too long. Um, it's, a, it's a very difficult viewing experience if you have a long short and then a feature. Um, so they, we tend to go for ones that are closer to um, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I really like shorter documentaries as well. We show quite a lot of um, 10 or 15 minute documentaries. There were 30 minute ones I really liked this year, but I couldn't fit them in. I just couldn't make it work in the program. And we have shown programs of short documentaries before, you know, putting two 30 minutes together or a, um, a, f a handful of 20 minute ones. They don't seem to be that satisfying for the audience. Perhaps it's harder for us to market or to um, get the sense of the program across, but they are very difficult. And it, but it does vary from festival to festival. Some of them just don't show 50-minute docos at all because they don't show short films. Um, and so they don't have a kind of program in the same way. On the other hand, it's worth looking out for themes because I remember for your 50th, you did a lot of 50-minute films. Yeah. Just, I know, mean, it, 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 sometimes it works, yeah. um, and but I mean, we generally don't go, um, don't generally say that I'm going to exclude that because of the length, um, and I will watch films of those length, but I know it's going to be harder to fit in the program um, if it's a if it's a short film over 20 minutes. Margaret Nash, uh, question, um, Jenny, about uh, premieres. What if a film has screened at an academic conference? <laughs> the, the premiere status is a very tricky one, um, but generally we say uh, for, for Sydney the rule is it can't have had a public screening. So if it's an invited audience, i.e. if you have to be a member of something or you have to be invited to go to it, then we don't see that as a public screening. But if it's, been at, and if it's been at a conference, then obviously you have to be invited to go to it. Yes. We don't see that as public screening. So I that's mean, okay. So it's okay. okay. It, it, I mean, the reason, I mean, there's many reasons why we have premier status, why any festival has them. Um, generally, we, if a film was already shown in Sydney, we can't get an audience. Mm. If it's already um, been promoted or marketed in Sydney, we can't get the marketing, mm. we can't get the media. You, mm. it's, it's, very, it's a very different proposition mm. to show a film that's already had some sort yeah. of life. Um, but, uh, we don't show films that have already been broadcast for the same reason. Mm. Okay, thanks. Hi, thanks for all of your tips and observations. I'm Janet Merriweather. I'm just finishing a just fine cut of a feature documentary that is international in nature, so it's been unable to have any broadcast support from ABC or SBS or Screen Australia because they won't finance anything with a non-Australian subject at the moment. So this is I guess why there's not many features being submitted to these wonderful international festivals because we're in an environment where Australian government won't f and bodies won't finance Australians to make global films. But that's just one observation. I'm just wondering what the risks are. Obviously we're all fine cutting films and we lock off at some point uh, and uh, with deadlines looming, a lot of the festivals have deadlines way before the festival, such as IDFA. You know, they want to see things four or five months out. Um, uh, you know, we're going to have to send ungraded, unmixed films. Obviously, that's a bit of a risk, but I'm guessing from most of you, in your observation, are you used to looking at films <laughs> that are incomplete uh, and whether that is a barrier? Um, also, whether there is advice available from Screen Australia at the moment about reputable and approaches to sales agents. I would imagine that most films would want to, on the back of a festival premiere, then attract a sales agent when the film has achieved or select, been selected. But again, Screen New South Wales and Screen Australia want market attachment in the very early stages and I'm just wondering why that is and wouldn't it be better on the back of some festival success? I can't talk about the funding side of it because I'm in the marketing department yeah. but I can tell you that, uh, anyway, that's the truth, um, 
that uh, the festival, the international festival selectors see many unfinished films. For something to keep in mind though, they'll only watch a film once. So it has to be at a stage where the story is coming through, you know, that all those emotional connections are happening for them to be want to, to want to put it forward to see it when it's complete. Um, so that's number one. And um, number two is we've got a sales agent directory up on our website. Uh, it's not uncommon for a film with no market attachments to be selected for an international festival and for a sales agent to come on board prior to it hitting that festival. So um, it does happen. Yeah, yeah. And I can just, actually, Janet, there are, um, in defence of Screen Australia, uh, The Last Impresario, which is not really a particularly um, Australian subject, had Screen Australia funding, um, and uh, Red Obsession, which has no Australian content, except, but it's made by Australians, has support from um, um, Screen Australia as well. Can you comment about the markets that are often attached to festivals, whether it's um, like worth, um, if you don't get into the festival, whether you can put your film in the markets and if you're not going to be there, is it worth it? Can you, can any of you talk about the markets? Well, it will cost you if you're going to have a screening and, um, and it's whether you're able to represent the film well enough. So it certainly is best to attend when you've got a film in the market or in the festival and then you can um, get some sales at the uh, adjoining market. Um, but um, market attendance is always something to be thinking about, um, you know, throughout the life of a film at, at all stages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but certainly the, you'll get the most leverage if you've got the film in the festival. Hey, you mentioned um, that some festivals don't take short films. Um, what are the ratios of uh, international documentary festivals that actually do feature short films alongside the, the features? Oh, um, and I wouldn't know the numbers. I mean, I'm, there, there are certainly... Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly IDFA has mid-lengths and it has pro short pro programs. CPH Docs does, um, Hot Dogs does. So quite a few of them do. Um, Sydney Film Festival, we show short films with features. That's less common these days. Um, Berlin Ali used to do that, and now they just have short film programs. So it's less common to see the old double bill of a short and a feature. Yeah, and MIF does the whole program. Yeah, MIF does the whole program too. And there's just so many more short films being submitted to the festivals now. We used to show all the uh, short films to selectors when they came to Australia, and there's just the, vo the sheer volume is too big now and they've usually uh, got separate people selecting them so it's it's just become so big. And Ruth, Ruth you could have something because you, you short film. Short film, yes. Um, yes, the, it's scary how many short films are made. Um, something like Sundance gets six or seven thousand um, and they take about two, one to two percent of shorts. Um, so it's, it's really scary. Um, Shorts are a growth industry. The, the growth of digital filmmaking has been a, a godsend in some ways and a disaster in terms of um, giving people, not giving people the chance to get into a festival. Um, it, it used to be much easier. So festivals now get so many shorts that some excellent films don't make it in. And um, it's, it's become to some extent a bit of a lottery. Um, sadly, um, which doesn't mean don't make shorts because they are really great. Yes and, yes. and also I would say again you have to ask yourself what are you hoping to get out of festivals because if you've made <coughs> a great short there are a million other ways to get something out of that short film. Mm -hmm. If it's to get it seen, if it's to get it um, uh, you know, to, for the exposure or uh, online, there's a million other opportunities that didn't exist for the most part 10-15 years ago when festivals were it. Um, I'd argue that maybe entering into a festival, f a short film into a festival, is a waste of entry fee. Mm, yeah, in, in many cases I'd agree that put it online and get as many people to see it as possible. And the other thing is that the broadcasters are often looking for three to five minute films. If they've got a thematic link you could make a whole series. I mean, 
you know, World War One's coming. There could be something every week for the next four years. Or, uh, you know, a little something before the news. You know what I mean? There are, I mean, so I think POV does that too, that wonderful um, uh, North American public broadcaster. They have a, a program that's funded by the, um, I think it's the National Library of Congress, which is all um, oral stories from different people all around the country. And they're animated. And they put, they just, they're wonderful. So there are ways to do it. But... You have to think of what, as, as you said, why you're doing it. Sorry, anything about that? Well, just on the why you're doing it, for me, it's always been to sell the film. So one of the things that being in festivals does, especially if you win a prize, is to make it look as if the film's a lot better than you know it really is. But anyway, <laughs> you know, it's amazing. Because a film that we once said, oh, God, we just can't make this film come out, it won the top documentary prize in the world at that point. You can never tell. But what it means is that it really helps in selling it. And also you have to remember that it's only um, probably the film people that know the prestige of the festival. So <laughs> the, the last little film I made, I made my first short, and it didn't do that well, even though I thought it was really good. Um, <laughs> But um, nevertheless, it's been shown at a string of festivals. And so, you know, I can say, God, look at all these festivals. And the, the general public, they don't know, or, you know, the educators, they don't know that it wasn't in Berlin. Um, but <laughs> but there, was, <laughs> there was something else about all of this, but I can't remember. I, I'll, I'll tell you what, I think uh, uh, being a staff pick on Vimeo, for example, with your short is worth... 20 of those small festivals in terms of exposure, in terms of no, getting... No, I'm interested in money. No, I know, but even in terms of money, in terms of monetizing oh, yeah. both the short and getting the exposure that gets you the money to make the other projects and the bigger ones, um, you know, the, it's easy to get lost with a short in, in a medium-sized festival. No, no, well, you know. I've made the big films. I'm now dwindling. <laughs> yeah. shorter, I mean, obviously, shorter. there's nothing quite like seeing your you film on the big screen, and that's... <laughs> I'm wondering if any of the panel is um, uh, aware of any festivals that might uh, accept expanded documentary. I myself am working with multiple screen documentary and later this year in October I'll be curating the first vertical film festival up in Katoomba. But uh, searching online I've only been able to unearth one other or two other examples, one in Amsterdam and one in Adelaide earlier this year. But apart from that, I'm just wondering if there's any... CPH docs. Ah, really? Great. All the media are. Rotterdam as well. Yeah, I think those those festivals that have resources, if they like your project, why not pitch to them about... Because a lot of festivals are interested in, you know, doing something that's a little bit different and will invest resources into showcasing your work in the way you've intended it if they feel like it's got value. Just on the back of what Martha was saying, some of you um, discussed um, screening fees and percentage of box office. I'm just wondering, is there a current going rate? Has that gone up or down or changed? It's zero. It's, there's no screening fee. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just mean more generally, maybe not your festival, but um, do I, yeah, Sydney Film Festival perhaps. Um, it, it's one of those things that globally is, is really varied. I mean, sales agents started charging fees probably about um, 15 years ago, something like that. Before that, all films were pretty much supplied free to f film festivals. Um, and then they started selectively charging different regions of the world, I think you could say. Um, and then Australian distributors started charging. Um, and as far as I know, they're the only distributors who worldwide do so. Um, I don't think, certainly they don't in the US, on on mass, I would say. Um, so it, it, it has become increasingly more common, but not um, to production companies, no. It, it does vary, um, and there's, there's not hard and fast rules, particularly, um, and, and certainly it's an environment that's been changing a lot overseas. Um, I think you may have read, uh, there's been much debate online about it as well, um, and IndieWire had a whole piece about how all film festivals should pay filmmakers. Um, Matt? Matt? I don't uh, know. Oh, Margo, sorry, Margo. Margo. Hi. Um, you did say something, and I just wanted you to clarify it because I didn't quite pick it up. Something about waiving fees in order to get 
a subtitled, subtitled copy yeah, of the film. Yeah, it's, it's just I know that um, in some cases when you uh, have an English language film that's selected in, say, a European film festival or an Asian film festival, uh, some festivals, the bigger ones, will pay to subtitle your film. Um, because, I mean, I'm French, and when I grew up, I, you know, if the film, is, some festivals will screen the film in English without subtitles, but it does limit the audience. A lot of festivals are interested in, in subtitling the films when they're not, you know, when it's not done. So, and they have deals, they have sponsorship, usually contra deals with subtitlers, especially in France, where all the subtitlers seem to live and work. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, some festivals will provide that service. Uh, and it's worth asking. Yeah, and I, I, I run a very small film festival called French. Access All Areas where we show only Australian films, we make them accessible to people with disabilities. Uh, and as part of that, we caption ah, and audio caption. describe the films uh, for the blind. So that's a service that we provide, but nothing stops you from then having that file uh, and that audio description file and putting it on your DVD, uh, you know, putting it out there, uh, when you're doing a broadcast deal, telling them that you've got that because that's got value. Um, so yeah, sometimes festivals can offer those extra little things. Oh, that's interesting. Um, you talk about this uh, working the circuit, so to speak. Um, does success in getting on one festival affect getting into other festivals? You know, can it can it actually um, stop you getting into some festivals if you've shown in one, and if you're rejected in by several, does that then, you know? mean you're going to get rejected by a lot of others? Yes, it will affect um, your next festival. So that's why you've got to plan it first. Plan your world premiere first, and then your international premiere, then all your territories. Because if you go and take an invitation to um, a, a small Australian local festival, it might be your hometown, and if that's your world premiere, you may then have stopped your film going, certainly you will have stopped it going to Venice, maybe to Cannes and maybe to Sundance, etc. So you have to think what's your first priority, your second priority, your third priority. So, yeah, you have to think about it. And, it, and it, it's happened. Films haven't been able to travel as well because um, they haven't planned that out. And also that will affect the sales agent too because the very first question your sales agent will ask you is, has it been submitted to any festivals? Has it been successful? Has it not been successful? So very often, it's, if you don't get into your first festival, it's probably wise to look for a sales agent before you go too far down that path. Can I just follow up on, on the, the distribution strategy or the festival strategy? When you're trying to plan that out, is it do you apply to a whole bunch of festivals and then see who, what you get in and, and then reject those? I don't accept an offer, or, or do you not apply until you apply to the big festivals? Or how would you go about doing that or thinking yeah, about so that? Yeah, so you're probably going to have to apply for a few of them at the same time, but make sure you've got your, make sure you know the ones that are most important to you, and you may have to then do a bit of a dance while you wait for some of your um, answers. It happens all the time. So, um, yeah, plan out the ones you want, but put in all your applications and then um, you might be in the very fortunate position of accepting the ones that work and, and not accepting others. Yeah, and how, how to do that dance, because like right now one of my films has been accepted to an Austin GLBT festival, but we wanted to go to the mainstream Austin festival, but we're waiting on hearing from Austin. And you know, how, how do you deal with thinking that through in terms of you have an offer on the table and you're trying to stall them and wait for the other answer? Do you have a sales agent or a distributor? Oh, uh, we don't, no. No, okay. So have you got a contact there that someone you can talk to? Um, yeah, at some point, you may have to fess up and say, look, I do have another offer on the table. When, when will I know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. First of all, the Austin LGBT festival is amazing. It's not, you know, it's, you shouldn't see it as a second or third choice. <laughs> but I would also say that um, the, the, it's important to be really transparent and to communicate with the programmers and let them know what, what you want to do and what you're hoping for, because there is nothing, there's no quicker way to ruin your relationship with programmers, not just for this film, but every future film you'll make, than to say, you know, to submit something, to submit a film, pretend that you're going to go there and then at the last minute say, well, actually, I'm, I'm going somewhere else. Um, I mean, I totally understand. I'm constantly talking to the filmmakers and the producers and the sales agents about where else they're applying, what, they, what they'd rather do. And I'll be really honest with them if I say, you know, actually, this other festival you're applying for, you'll get more out of it than ours. I will tell them 
Um, but I also expect in return the filmmaker to be transparent about that and to not kind of, you know, the day before I'm going to print going, oh, actually, I'd also submitted to this other festival and that's where we're going. Yeah, I th I'd second that. You have to be honest. And I think it comes back to that point about really doing your research and working out um, where you want your film to go, where the best match is, and then really mapping that out, saying this is, this is my first choice, this is my second. But of course, because of all the deadlines, you will have to reply, but then you'll, you'll have to have this kind of juggling as to which is really going to be best for your film. And you know, the, the, as you say, a film festival can say, well, actually, you know, it's really going to do better with us or with the other festival, but you do have to talk to them and you have to be honest. And sometimes, you know, you might want a decision earlier. Occasionally that's possible. Sometimes it's just not. Um, it, particularly if your film's in, in the running, it, it's very hard to say, well, I can't tell you now because I've got about another 200 to watch before I make a decision. That's, it. that's, that's what it boils down to. And, and be aware of the slot that they offer you because there are some slots are better than other slots. So um, closing weekend is uh, on some festivals it's not so good because the industry's gone home and all the sales agents are gone and you know some of the industry is not going to see your film. So, but it's different for every festival, so you've got to assess what is it they've actually offered you. Not so is that okay to ask once you get accepted? What slot are you thinking about giving us? That's yes, a fair absolutely. Question. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I think the key is early enough because usually the point at which we schedule is about is over a period of maybe 10 days. So if we know at the beginning that we're going to have to put something early or late in the festival, we can do it. Once we've got to the end of that 10 days and we've juggled everything into position, it becomes really hard to move. But also be a real, be be like trust the programmers and tr and trust them when they say your film is going to work in this two hundred seater rather than this thousand seater that also exists. Um, they they've got years and years of experience with all these films and what they're going to do. Um, don't take it the wrong way. Don't ask to be upgraded to the biggest cinema necessarily or the prime time slot. Or a lot of thought goes into this, and you know you have to trust the process as well. Oh, Cinema des Antipodes in Saint Tropez. Ben Arbery, who runs it, is, is amazing. Um, I feel I should praise him at all opportunities. Um, he runs screenings at Cannes during the market. Um, the only country I understand, well, definitely, because I've seen the program, the only country that gets a guaranteed um, s multiple screening slots um, during the, what they call Cannes Cinephile, which is a sort of um, sidebar program to the main festival. Um, Australia and New Zealand films are there every year and Bernard programs them. Um, he does a single program devoted, devoted to afters films, which is great. Um, and then later in the year, in October, he runs the Saint-Tropez Film Festival for, again, Australia and New Zealand films, which is competitive. And um, that's grown, I think, fairly, fairly largely. Um, I know a lot of people don't particularly want their films to screen there during the first year of their release um, because it is a small festival and it, it would jeopardize a bigger one. Um, but again, I mean, if you talk to him, he's very, very cooperative and will will do everything he can to get the film screened to your advantage. Obviously, a trailer up on Vimeo or YouTube in advance to a festival, a world premiere, is that acceptable you get it on IndieWire or one of those things it's much better to have your trailer there than everyone but in, yeah. yeah I mean obviously yeah put it on Vimeo or YouTube mm -hmm. alert people to its existence so that it can be embedded when there's a a, a review or an, an item on your film I've just also seen really bad trailers uh, often cut by the filmmaker themselves uh, and some filmmakers are great at cutting trailers and others are not usually much longer than they need to be uh, and that do a disservice to the film. If it, if it were me, I, I would say, you know, it depends on the, size, on the length of your film and what it's got to say, but you can, you can be extremely effective at teasing an audience and getting them to want to see the film with 30 seconds. Um, I've seen trailers that are two and a half, three minutes long, and they, I just, you know, if you turn off a trailer midway through, you're not gonna wanna watch the feature as a submission. You know, it's, it's, you know, shorter is better. And ideally someone who didn't make the film just because they're gonna cut what they wanna see and they're going to f have a different kind of approach to, to what works. 
I think there's also a case to be made for strategizing your trailer release, um, rather like your film, just kind of plan. I mean, the ideal is that you've got a website that was there from the very beginning of your film's conception that you were building on, but that you can also use that and use the support you get through social media on that to actually sort of announce your trailer and use your trailer in that way. It's actually interesting to look at the Herzog production of Queen of the Desert, he's done right from the beginning, the two, two of the producers and him, they've been, all the way through they've been, you can go on to the site, it's really interesting what they've done. And the trailer that your sales agent does, uh, the longer version that they show in the market is not the same one that you'd put up on social media to attract an audience, so you don't want to give the story away. Just beware as well if you're making a sale to a local broadcaster that you can't always control when your film's programmed on local broadcasters and uh, they can screen your, your film which will um, make it then ineligible for Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, Adelaide Film Festivals. So perhaps just watch out when you take a film if you want to sell it to the ABC or SBS that you may not have control always of when it's programmed. Highly unlikely to have complete control, I would think, but you can have a clause in your contract that says specifies a date it won't go to air before. Yeah, well, that's, that's go if that's your deal breaker, then that's the thing you have to go for. No, well, I'm, what I'm saying that it is possible to negotiate that it can't be till June 30 or something. I mean, we yeah. talked to the broadcasters about uh, Windows and what's possible. Some films they're able to um, schedule after the festival and some of them they simply can't because they're in, they're in, a, in a particular focus or strand that's going to be earlier and they can't do anything. But they're, they're usually fairly flexible yeah. for In us. fact, in some cases, they're more flexible than the theatrical, uh, the exhibitors because if your sales agent doesn't have uh, or distributor doesn't have its own cinema outlet, like say Village Roadshow does, then you're at the behest of what the exhibitors put on. So you've got just as little control, if not less. Maybe we should say thank you to everybody. You've all been so generous. <laughs>